The following program is sponsored by Friends of Life Outreach International. Next, finding deliverance from your afflictions, regardless of your past. Did my affliction come out of my past sin? See, it's a problem when you have my kind of past. You have to think, are all my problems associated with it? And I can always come up with yes, yes. It's all because I was stupid. Anybody else besides me? Um, I mean, some of you are going, we need a new teacher. And um... <laughs> Overcoming your afflictions, next on Life Today. Welcome to Life Today. I'm James Robinson. Betty and I are so grateful that we get to present God's truth, His love, and opportunities to express His love. Not only experience it and receive the blessings of His love and teaching and inspiration through guests and insights that we share, but also through Beth Moore and her wonderful teaching. She is talking about affliction, and uh, we all have them. Um, some of you know that we ended the year with the death of our daughter three days after Christmas and her funeral the day after New Year's. A girl that said when she found she had cancer seven years before, signing every email, I win, I win. The last words that Robin spoke to me as I stood at the foot of her bed, we win. What she said to her son, her teenage son who spoke at her funeral, Absolutely. Amazing. Uh, we want to share with you about Robin uh, tomorrow. And uh, as Beth talks about affliction, we all go through pressure, don't we? Uh, you'll be praying for us as we share tomorrow. You'll want to meet her. I can promise you, you will know more wonderfully than ever the one who heals the broken heart. And that's what we do with the outreaches of life because of you. Otherwise, we would just have a broken heart and could do nothing about it. But we're able to alleviate suffering because of people like you. Here's Beth. Be blessed. All right, notice something with me. Psalm 25, remember our context, turn to me and be gracious to me for I'm lonely and afflicted. Verse 16, the troubles of my heart are enlarged. Bring me out of my distresses. Consider my affliction and my trouble. That's become our, um, we're considering our affliction through this series. That has become our theme. Notice this is what it says. Consider my affliction and my trouble and forgive all my sins. Consider how many are my foes. You and I know what kind of foe that is to us. And with what violent hatred they hate me. Now stop right there and notice something. Consider my affliction and trouble. Okay, now wait a minute. Forgive all my, and forgive all my sins. What does sin have to do with affliction and trouble? I mean, that annoys me in the flesh. So I'm trying to understand it. And the spirit, what does that have to do with anything here? Because did my affliction come out of my past sin? See, it's a problem when you have my kind of past. You have to think, are all my problems associated with it? And I can always come up with yes, yes. It's all because I was stupid. Anybody else besides me? Um, I mean, some of you are going, we need a new teacher. And um, <laughs> maybe you need to pray for the one you've got. Maybe that would would be good. Uh, but yes, uh, because I have so much stuff in my past, almost always I can come with, yes, yes it does. Yes it does. But it may not. Sometimes it doesn't have anything to do with it. Um, I, I don't live in that pattern of defeat and sin that I used to and haven't for years and yet I still deal uh, with this affliction of having these um, ongoing uh, visits of a time. Again, I'm not saying a, a demon is visiting me. I'm saying it's just like a here we go again and I'm going through this again and then I go through the very same thing to be set free from it and it's always the word. But, but here's what I know. Um, whether or not my affliction came out of my past sin, because I don't really think this one, in a lot of ways, is so it's not certainly not associated with it in the current. Um, does trouble and affliction? Notice the order. Consider my affliction and my trouble, and forgive what? All Say it again. All forgive all my sins. What I have found is my affliction and my trouble 
makes it a whole lot easier to sin. Anybody? So whether or not my sin had anything to do with causing the affliction or the trouble, man, it makes it easier to sin, doesn't it? Because my trouble makes me cranky, makes me irritable, um, it makes me um, just more carnal. Um, our affliction can just be the, I mean, it's just like when we, when we submit to it, it's sin. It's sin because it has no power to defeat us. It is supposed to bring us into submission to Christ, not defeat us. So here's what I love, because instead of sitting back, like my, my um, tendency would be to sit back and go, oh, woe is me. My sin caused all this. My sin caused all this. Oh, I bet this was all my sin. When the psalmist goes, you know what? Just like get a grip, and no matter what your affliction or your trouble, ask God to forgive all your sins and mean it. Mean it. It's like just here's the remedy. When you confess and you repent, you are forgiven. So I never have to go on worrying the next day too. It's oh, No, no. That matter was settled. So no matter what, consider my affliction and my trouble in the Lord because that is so, so tempting for an area of sin in my life. Forgive me for all my sins. Look at verse 11 in the same uh, chapter. Um, Psalm 25, verse 11. I want you to see this because this is going to be somebody's word. So do not Turn it off right now. Stay with me. Verse 11, I mean, he's all about how good God is to him, how he leads the humble and what is right. All the paths of the Lord, steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his testimonies. And then he says this, for your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my guilt, for it is great. Now, remember when he said earlier in the psalm, and go, go read it if you were not with us, when he says, remember not the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me for the sake of your goodness, O Lord. What is he saying? Lord, I want you to remember me, but I want you to remember me free of my past sins. Anybody else? Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that just beautiful? I want that. And every time I say it, I go, Lord, I, I want that to be me. So the psalmist then says, just like, pardon my guilt, for it is great. And I want to say to you today, because this is a huge one for no telling how many people we've got gathered here and are, are, are on the other side of that screen. Listen carefully. Untreated guilt is the most fertile soil on planet Earth for growing affliction. I promise you, girlfriend and guy friend, that that is the truth. I'm going to say it again. Untreated guilt is the most fertile soil on Earth if you want to grow an affliction. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir, it is. So when you've got all this untreated guilt, when you feel guilty, you have kind of an ongoing, I'm not saying every now and then, but I'm saying you've got pretty persistent guilt, then I'm just telling you, you're just an affliction waiting to happen because your ongoing guilt is your manure <laughs> and your affliction field. It's going to grow it up. It's just fertilizing it over and over and over and over again. Uh, the question on the table for you over the next couple of minutes is, what are a few reasons why Satan would want you to keep a messed up conscience? What is in it for the devil if you keep a messed up conscience? The Apostle Paul says, I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit. Okay, listen. For believers in Christ, when you and I receive Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, His Spirit comes to dwell in us instantly. It, it's not because we felt it. It's not because we go, oh, that, I just felt that happen. None of that. I, you could go on for years without feeling it because we've not yet let yielded to the Holy Spirit, but he moves in us, takes up residence immediately. And what he does is that the way the Holy Spirit will, will bear witness is to involve our conscience. In fact, go with me just to Romans 8, 16. Now, Lord, give me clarity as I, as I speak this so there's understanding. Okay, this is good. This is good. This is good. Okay, 8, 16. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. The, the, Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. The Holy Spirit comes up and takes residency in our spirit. The spirit is involving the conscience in a lot of things to bear witness to us. Listen, when we, I, if I were a betting woman, 
I would bet you 10 to 1 that if you have a really whacked out conscience and uh, a very guilty conscience, I bet you spend untold amounts of time conflicted over whether or not you are in Christ. Am I telling the truth? Somebody with a really good, they'll go back and forth, I don't know if I'm saved or not. I don't have any, yeah, if I'm saved. Why? Because their conscience is so messed up that it's not bearing witness with the witness of the Holy Spirit. So we, we don't even know. So all this that would be revealed to us, so much, so much is not revealed, but so much would be. But if we're, we've got a whacked out conscience, we cannot even hear or experience the bearing of the witness of the Holy Spirit because he's working with a conscience that is not cooperating. So my conscience is always telling me something contrary to it. And I just am so wrapped up in the guilt, I can't get out from under. Is that making sense to anybody? So here, here's, here's what we've got. Listen to Hebrews 10, 22. You can jot down the address and, and, and hear it with all of your heart. I'm going to read it to you out of the NIV because it doesn't get better than this. Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith. Full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience. I'm going to say that again. Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience. Okay, do you have a guilty conscience? Draw near to God. See, here's the trick the enemy plays is, I can't draw near to him. I've got a guilty conscience. Listen to the order. All we have to, we come with just sincerity. This is how we come to him. I sincerely have a guilty conscience. Okay? Just, we come with sincerity before God. Here I'm coming with this. I'm coming with this. The enemy knows I can make you feel guilty enough or I can help you, I can tempt you to feel guilty enough where you won't draw near. And then we're not going to have any power at all. No assurance at all. And so this is what he does. But, but when we just go, I'm going to believe the word over my guilty conscience. All I have to do is have a sincere heart. All I have to do. And I'm sincere about it. I'm in pain here, Lord. I'm tormented by guilt. And your word says, all I have to do is just draw near to you and with a full assurance of faith, I, that your word says, what was the Savior for? But to pardon my guilt. And I ask your forgiveness. And I never, I never want to drop back in that hole again. Lord, I never want to turn back to that that has caused me so much pain and so much guilt for so many years. Forgive me by the blood of Jesus sprinkled on my heart of flesh forgive me. And he does. And then you don't get up and go the next day, oh, pardon my guilt. He did that yesterday. <laughs> you do when you feel guilty again, but you don't just keep doing it. Because why? Because he already did it. Yeah. Then the next day we go, we're tempted to do it again, but we go, you know what? Uh -uh, now this time I'm going to thank him for it. I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord. I thank you. You have cleansed me from my guilty conscience. Genesis 41, I want to show you something. 50 through 52. Genesis 41, 50 through 52. Our last point that we made together was the love of Scripture applied separates affliction from destruction. Um, and then we're going to land on five in just a moment and we're going to find it at Genesis 41, um, 50 through 52. And it says this, before the year of famine came, it's very important that you see it's before the famine came because the famine is what's going to lead to his family being restored. Before it ever came, two sons were born to Joseph. Asenath, the daughter of uh, Potiphar, a priest of On, bore them to him. Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh, for he said, God has made me forget all my hardship and all my father's house. Um, Manasseh roughly means God has made me forget. That can be a beautiful thing. Many of us need a Manasseh. Um, I could use a Manasseh at so many times. Verse 52, the name of the second he called Ephraim. For the Lord has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. Listen, he was going to deliver Joseph, but he was not going to deliver him yet. He was going to let him be used of God to be fruitful right there in the land of his affliction. Then he was going to bring him out. And I believe that has been a test that God has put before me. Beth, I, I'm not going to deliver you from it until you get consistently victorious in it. 
until you just want to go, oh, really, do you want to toy with me again about this? Because I already know what to do. Um, I'm going to, you know, because I'm going to be wiser than you. I mean, know what to do it. And when you get where that is your practice and we don't have to keep beating on that one, then we're going to move on. But really, Beth, what I want before I just move you out of your affliction and then you get to be all victorious, what about being victorious in the affliction? Mm -hmm. yes. Because, girlfriend, there ain't no high like that. Mm -hmm. Guy friend, it doesn't get more powerful than that because you know something should be taking you down mm -hmm. and all it is doing is taking you down to your knees mm -hmm. and it doesn't get better than that. Yes. Right yes. there. Yes. Right there. Five and last point we'll make together in our series. Until we're delivered, may God make the land of our affliction fruitful. Fruitful. Say it back to me. Number five is, until we're delivered, may God make the land of our affliction fruitful. You got an affliction? You are on fertile ground. Now, it's up to you what you're going to grow there. You can either grow the fruit of the Spirit and the fruit of uh, faithfulness and a love of the Word and the true discipline of the Spirit, ministry, compassion, humility, or you can grow the most frightful harvest of your life. Bend the knee. Get some of that fertile soil right on those knees. Submit and bear fruit. To obtain information on Beth's teaching materials and for her speaking schedule, visit us online at lifetoday.org. Wow. I, uh, I tell you what, I want to grow the best fruit. I, I want, I'm going to read something I grandson wrote, Randy's son, we have six grandsons, about Robin, our daughter. We're going to talk about her tomorrow. We lost her at the end of the year, seven-year battle with cancer. And that was a heavy load. Thanks for praying for us. Alec wrote, and this is available online, lifetoday.org, in memory of Robin Turner, talking about her being a beautiful flower. Talked about her going to be with the Lord in God's greenhouse. He will bring us to his greenhouse and preserve us too. We will reunite with her and we will grow close to our gardener who blessed us with her presence, referring to Robin, in his earth garden. For now though, we must grow for her. That's a nephew writing about, about his aunt. That's the proper response you'd want a teenager to have. That's the response her teenage children had. She was a light. She was an inspiration. We're going to grow because she inspired us, but also for God. We're going to do the works of our wonderful Lord. And there may not be a greater expression of sharing his love than to do what he just said. If you just give a, if you just give a cup of water in my name, you won't lose the reward God has for you, which is the blessing of his presence and his care and his love. Would you give a cup of water? You must wonder, what, what does it mean if you gave many cups? What if you gave a well of water to a whole community? We have an opportunity. I want you to take a journey, but I want you to be the answer to the heartfelt concern you hear. And I am so brokenhearted 
over what I saw, what I saw happening to the children, family after family that has lost little children. And they're so upset because they have no way to change anything. It's in their water. And water is necessary for life. And they have such adversity, such a hard, hard life, mainly because of the water. There's so many things that would just mushroom and grow out of having a well right there, that that's just the beginning. And I want us to begin with the most basic thing, giving them clean water. That's the best place to start right now. Let's do it together. You know, as I listen to Jeannie, a mother and a grandmother, and someone who came to Christ, and as I was preaching, and we've worked together to win people to Christ, as I listen to her and know her heart, and I think about the mothers that she is referencing and, and appealing in many ways in behalf of, Betty and I can't help but think about how precious our youngest daughter will always be to us. And how when we watched her fight the battle until in her final moments she ultimately went to be with the Lord. I know what it would have meant to us if someone could have walked in and said we can change everything uh, because we love our family. Now, b listen to me. Those mothers and those parents feel the same way about their children. And many of them don't get to enjoy their child until they're 25 or 30 or 40. They, they lose them at, at five or six or even younger. But the difference in their battle is that we have the absolute perfect solution. And yes, of course, it's love, but it's an expression of love. It's one thing to talk about love. It's another thing to give them clean water. Betty, we can give those mothers what their heart desire and those children what they need. We absolutely can. And you know, all these years, when we've appealed to you about the heartache of a mother losing a child, I would weep. I would try my best to sense the hurt and feel the hurt that they felt. I know firsthand now, it hurts when you see your child laying there and you have nothing that you can do for them. It's different in this situation, though. They have a hope that is through the water wells and through helping these precious children simply by giving them fresh, pure, clean water. We can do that with your help. We ask you to do just what Betty said. Be the answer to their prayer, the solution to their hurt, heartache, and their potential loss by being a part of a miracle. We have targeted 500 areas in more than 12 countries where we want to drill wells. It will touch hundreds and hundreds and transform thousands of lives and give them a chance, all because of love. Would you right now reach out, dial the number, or go online, lifetoday.org, or get up and go and, and get a check and uh, make it to life put it in an envelope addressed to life, or call the number right now, and, and, and regardless of what you do about if you mail it or you want to put it on a bank card, call us now and say, here's my gift. The wells cost $4,800. No greater impact than giving people water. A cup of water, a well of water in Jesus' name. Can you give a well? Could you give part of a well? $1,200, pray three, join you, or listen to me. $144 gives 30 people water the rest of their life. $48, don't think that's small because it gives 10 people a chance at life. It'll give them water. Would you please dial the number, go online, and make the best gift you can to give the greatest gift life. We have some beautiful gifts to give you to bless you in your spiritual journey and to encourage you. Thank you so much for making that call. Thank you for making the gift of love and sharing water for life. Every day, millions of children are forced to make a dreadful choice. Drink filthy, polluted water filled with deadly disease or die from thirst. No child should ever be faced with this decision. The good news is there is a solution. 
Mission Water for Life is one of the most exciting and viable demonstrations of God's love in the world today. Suffering can end because clean water changes everything. With your gift today, we can establish and drill 500 new water wells for remote villages in over 12 different nations. Your gift of $24 will help provide clean water for five people. A gift of $48 will help provide for 10 people. $72 will impact 15 people. And $144 will help provide fresh, clean, disease-free water for 30 people for a lifetime. With your gift, be sure to request Beth Moore's Blessed Mornings and Restful Nights, a beautiful new daily devotional to begin and end your day in God's presence. With your gift of $100 or more, you may request Morning and Evening, I Will Praise You, a two-CD collection of 20 instrumental hymns and a companion book that shares the stories behind each hymn. Also, please prayerfully consider a gift of $1,200 to help provide water for 250 people or a gift of $4,800 to help sponsor a complete well. And be sure to request the limited edition 50th anniversary bronze sculpture, Living Water, by artist Robert Summers. Please call, write, or make your secure gift online today. Well, Betty and I thank you for calling that number. Remember, if you ever get a busy, sometimes people are calling because they have a broken heart. They need prayer and the call is paid for by love. But others may be calling saying, we want to provide water, but, but press on. And, and ask for blessed mornings and restful nights, devotions, great way to start the day and end the day with Beth Moore. Hymns, the great hymns and the inspiration for them, how and what inspired them to be written, and the CD, instrumental. The beautiful bronze, the commemorative celebration of our 50 years of ministry and marriage, and I'm glad. <laughs> Uh, we want you to share it with us. Mark down and plan to come to the Dallas-Fort Worth area, just west of the airport in Dallas, the International Airport, in South Lake Gateway Church, where Robert Morris is pastor, where Betty and I go. And uh, we're going to have a conference there, hosted at Gateway, uh, that will really be, I think, the beginning of a great awakening and renewal for many of you. So plan to come and be with us. Thanks so much for your help. Tomorrow on Life Today, James and Betty discuss the life and inspiration of their youngest daughter, Robin, who recently passed away to be with the Lord. Life Today is made possible by the supporters of Life Outreach International. Your gift will be used exclusively for the exempt purposes of life. The ministry features specific outreaches as examples of the programs it supports and conducts. Gifts are considered to be without restriction as to use unless explicitly stipulated by the donor. The ministry is a member of the ECFA.